Among the many genres in the video game industry, horror games have a larger and more complex system that extends farther than just dropping the protagonist in the scenario with bullet sponge NPCs. With this system, industry titans of the horror genre are easily recognized, such as Resident Evil, Silent Hill, and Dead Space that give the genre a spotlight in the market. Whether it's blasting necromorphs in the USG Ishimura, surviving the zombie-infested Raccoon City, traversing through Castle Brandenburg, or escaping Mount Massive Asylum, there's many elements that make these titles strong in the horror game industry. My name is Arsenal, I'll be taking a look into the horror game genre and what makes it so effective. Some games work effectively, while some don't. It's an ironic situation for the player in a sense. They have to progress despite the tension rising on each occasion, almost as a way to face their fears. To be honest, I'm not into the horror genre as much as others might be, but it's an important genre that requires elaborate details and design for it to work effectively on the player. Throughout this video, we'll be taking a look at five details that I believe are key to a horror game's build. Defining horror, art design, sound, gameplay, and jump scares. There'll be a few examples to draw from, some games that are considered high quality in the community of horror games some of which I've played multiple times, and some I've played for the first time to get a better understanding of what makes them so memorable. We won't be getting into the narrative storytelling element, so don't worry about any big spoilers. If anything, there will only be minor spoilers of certain events. The main focus is on the structure of a horror game. So, without further ado, let's begin. Before we look into the elements that make a horror game, it's important to look into the defining points of what the horror genre is. Horror, in its basic definition, is an intense feeling of fear, shock, or disgust. In other words, it's meant to cause a specific reaction. The history of the genre is fairly interesting, having high points like the Slenderman games that got so many content creators to look into it back in 2012, and the start of the now popular Five Nights at Freddy's series that started back in 2014. Both showcase a strategy in the horror genre that is almost always constantly changing its formula and how it's perceived as opposed to older titles. Back in 1992, called Alone in the Dark, a series that is now a shallow shell of its former self thanks to the remakes that tried to bring the title back to life. Disregarding what came later in the series, Alone in the Dark is more of a mystery game that occasionally involved fighting monsters, solving puzzles, and discovering interesting gameplay mechanics on different playthroughs. Okay, this game hasn't aged well, but there is something to take away from it. For starters, it essentially paved the way for Resident Evil. There are striking similarities, such as the fixed camera angle and atmosphere. Both take place in a creepy mansion with a creepy atmosphere of isolation, and that's essentially part of what the horror genre is about. Attempting to catch players off guard, whether that's through the sound, design, or the gameplay to make the player feel defenseless in some cases. It's worth noting the impact Alone at the Dark made in its time, undoubtedly setting a build for horror games to come. Many took place in an abandoned building, Clock Tower in 1995, Resident Evil in 1996, only to have the setting expanded to a larger scale in 1999 with Silent Hill. 
Today, the horror genre has expanded into various settings, such as Cry of Fear with its massive psychological narrative, Alien Isolation in the science fiction genre along with its movie counterpart, Penumbra in an isolated tundra, Layers of Fear based in obsessed artist's adult mind, and Condemned Suburban Investigations. Each title has a unique setting to put the player in, and thus this leads us into one of the elements of horror games. In most cases for horror games, players are placed in a dark and grungy looking setting. This is meant to give a sense of something isn't quite right or anything could be hiding in a dark corner kind of feeling as the player continues on alone in most settings. The player will either find themselves wandering in dirty and decrepit houses and castles or finding trails of blood, sometimes being the direction of progression throughout the story, in said locations to indicate a possible danger is out and about. Games like Outlast, where the player investigates an asylum, introduces the art direction very early on once the player is inside Mount Massive Asylum. Open a door down the hall and players are greeted with a loud jump scare with plenty of evidence showing a dangerous presence is obviously about. This would be the case of an extreme design choice to build a chilling atmosphere into the player, using graphic visuals just to get its point across. In some cases this works, but there is another design choice that would work on the other side of the spectrum. Let's consider that there might be a char as to how to design the look of horror. One end would use blood and gore, while the other end would use other methods such as an empty city seen in Silent Hill, or Cry of Fear, or an empty space station seen in Alien Isolation. I'm not saying that there's a correct way to portray an art direction for horror. There's simply different methods to get the player to feel immersed into the game's setting. There can be an instance where there's too much of an attempt that may take the player out of the immersion. Fear, a series that mixes first-person action into a horror narrative, occasionally does this with massive pools of blood that seem way too much to be taken seriously. Even the smallest amount of blood would be enough to put someone on edge, moving slowly and checking around corners often before venturing onward. NPC designs are pretty important as well in this category. Cry Fear is a special case of design as each monster has a unique look connected to the narrative of the protagonist, Simon. Just through some small glances at the design will give you an idea of where these monsters fit in. Sometimes it's to unease the player or throw them off guard as some of these creatures crawl around instead of walking. Let's take a look at another game's monster design. Zombies are a pretty basic design since they're usually just any human body with blood or decay on their clothes and or body. So what about a series that established itself with its arts direction? Hold still, Isaac. I'm syncing up everyone's rig with the ship. Okay, we're done. Clean bill of health for everyone. Most would easily recognize the rig suits of Dead Space purely from the health bar on someone's back. It's essentially the HUD of the entire game, so players have the entire screen to look at the abandoned Ishimura spaceship, and having a third person perspective allows for some sneaky attacks to be noticed just off screen. Now, let's focus on the necromorphs of Dead Space 1 and 2. I'm not looking at Dead Space 3 for this video, I think we'll both agree that EA is a scary monster as it is. So the necromorphs are designed with the ragdolls in mind that players will find across the Ishimura and can easily control them turning them into a twisted form of flesh that pure it looks unsettling. In Dead Space 1, players will only encounter some variants that require the same tactic. Go for the limbs. Dismember them. Dismembering enemy limbs. You gotta cut off the limbs! <laughs> then players will meet these two atrocities. These two necromorphs earn their creepy tiles through their design. The lurker necromorphs are formed from infants as the wiki describes them, and over time they'll become less creepy as Isaac literally kicks them across the room. The divider, however, throws the aim for the limb rules out of the equation. Once they really give a meaning to their name, then it's just blasting a tiny target making disgusting noises similar to bones cracking against each other. You'd think that Dead Space might have the creepy factor out of the series, right? Well, the sequel wanted to up that scale by 10.
These are all elements that are meant to purely build a tension of being creepy, bringing a chilling crawl to the player's spine by mixing looks of familiarity such as, oh I can tell what that used to be, to oh god why. By that I mean questions will pop up as to how it makes sense. Doing too much of this might take the player out of the element and proceed to go all doom guy on every single necromorph in the entire galaxy. Other elements like sound or gameplay do factor into an NPC's effect, but we'll get to that later with examples like the Xenomorph in Alien Isolation or Mr. X in the Resident Evil 2 remake. Most elements work well together, but design has one in particular that is almost always present in horror titles, and it's one that players rely on heavily. This brings us to the use of lighting, a fairly simple system in horror games. For example, Amnesia the Dark Descent has a lighting system supported by a sanity system, where the player must approach candles to get any visibility without the use of a flashlight, or in this game's case, a lantern. And this is required to keep a stable sanity bar, otherwise the player character will collapse on the floor risking loss of progress. I've fallen, and I can get- SHUT UP GRANDMA! Fear of the Dark is described as losing the sense of sight, where just about anything could be in the dark waiting for the player to slip up in the slightest mistake. With a limited view given by a source of light, whether it's a flashlight or a lantern, causes more caution on a first playthrough of a game focused in dark settings. Hearing or seeing anything just out of visible range easily tempts the player to turn around and investigate to ensure their survival. Both Outlast and Amnesia grant the player resources to combat this. Outlast with batteries for a night vision camera, and Amnesia with a lantern that requires oil to be used. Let's say the player is out of those resources. The other option is to press on until there is more than enough light to help the player feel safe again. Or at least somewhat safe. Horror games seem to almost always have a darkly lit section requiring some kind of flashlight taken away one of the essential needs for a player to progress through the story. It helps create a feeling of vulnerability. Throughout Cry of Fear, the player is given a phone that gives minimal light similar to a lantern. So there's an uneasy feeling of security when you consider how close one monster could get without being seen if the room is pitch black. And Silent Hill 2 is a hidden trait to the flashlight and radio that the player is given. If both of them are turned off, the creatures will not attack the player. Obviously it's hard to see it, but you'll skulk through town without a fight, and can go near anything that could be considered dangerous. The only tradeback is that you must have the flashlight on in order to investigate any item that you come across. The usual use of lighting is where darkness is meant to fill a sense of dread. Something is hiding without the player knowing it, while light acts as a marker to progress. A source of light might be pointing to a certain direction or a prop that will be useful to the player's objective. Outlast does it in a very unique way with the night vision camera given at the very start of the game. Players can spy enemies just by their pupils in the darkness, and they might attack or just stare in the distance just to creep you out. This is section in Outlast where the camera is lost, and the player must find it in a dark section of the asylum. The camera is found by the light beaming in the dark. Progress, right? Hi, how are you? Fear was considered breaking for graphics during its time by its unique lighting system as the lights could be damaged by combat or environment changes, pulsing violently to test the player's vision. While playing through the game, it was a rare occurrence for Fear to play a scare in the dark. For its sequel, Fear 2 Project Origin, there was a section that tests the player's ability to stay calm. We'll come back to the section. There's a lot of elements that happen in this one section. Overall, lighting is meant to guide the player in the horror genre, and acts as an element to give a sense of danger. It puts the player on edge as the lights flicker in and out as sight is taken away, to give a crippling sense of isolation or helplessness. Once the dark has completely engulfed the player's sight, any sudden noise would trigger a sense of urgency to get back into the light. Which leads us to... Sound is one of the most important elements of a horror game. It's what does most of the work to bring the player into an immersive experience. Everything has to fit into the world that is being built for the game setting. One sound out of place could make or break it with ease if someone notices it.
Ambience in particular needs to fill the atmosphere, not as a means to scare the player, but to unease them and make the world have a life of its own. Most players might cite Amnesia's Castle Brennenberg's ambience, and rightly so, with its echoey halls that create a sinister atmosphere, sometimes supported with light music. Moments like this are meant to build up the feeling of isolation and helplessness. Here's a couple more examples I'd like to cite that nailed the ambience of their worlds. Each of these games had one thing in common, and I'm curious if you caught on to it. Footsteps. The player's own footsteps fill the atmosphere as well. This can be a way to immerse the player but also keep an ear out for anything out of the ordinary, such as somebody else's footsteps. It's like a tempo in music. Players will get a rhythm going and anything out of tempo will cause them to stop and figure out what was out of place. I'd like to cite a recent ghost hunting game called Phasmophobia. Here, players of up to four are meant to investigate paranormal activity in a haunted building, and it's always been uneasy for me to enter the front door because of this. This wild gush of ambience fills the atmosphere in mere seconds. And keep in mind this game doesn't have a music track, so this is what players will hear a majority of the time as they anticipate ghost activity, whether they hiss into their ears, turn off the lights, appear for a few seconds, or attempt to take out one of the players. Slow paced kind of game, so it might not be for everyone, but I believe that's what makes the horror genre so special. It's at its best when the game thrives on defeating the player's internal defenses slowly. Two games in particular use a unique sound effect, Resident Evil 2 Remake and Alien Isolation. Players who have played these two titles might know where I'm going with this. It's basically a sound effect that gives the player an idea of where a certain dangerous threat is. These sound effects create a presence for the imminent threat that is approaching. It starts to become familiar to the player after a while as a warning. All these sound effects are meant to whittle down the player's sense of staying calm, to immerse them into the world. Two noteworthy moments are stuck in my head from Cry of Fear, and they're both there simply to make the player think something is there when in actuality there isn't. One part of the game is in a dark section of corridors, and suddenly a chainsaw is heard in the distance. Now, the player has only encountered monsters with small weapons, so this is an unknown encounter if it's a first-time playthrough. Now, this this might be my favorite part of the mod, or my favorite scary part. So simple and easy, yet so damn pro. The idea behind this is that we wanted the players to think that they are chased by a guy with a chainsaw, and uh, but there's really not no one there. It's just some sounds playing, and. Uh, but the players really think that it could be a guy with a chainsaw because they have just met a, a guy with a chainsaw, the boss. So, 
it's a very good thing to trick the players to think that they are chased by someone but they aren't so this is really what psychological horror is about it's just fucking with your head the second part is in the section where the player has to use flares to light the way due to the phone's flashlight battery dying. Halfway through, the player is given some mm, nice sounds that are more or less there to make the player want to move as fast as humanly possible. And once again, there's nothing there. It's all a mind game that proves the effectiveness of sound in a horror game. I'd like to also point to the importance of music in some of these titles. Personally, I prefer horror games to keep music to a minimum, but I found myself appreciating a lot of the music in certain games. For this section, I'll focus on six titles. Outlast, Amnesia the Dark Descent, Alien Isolation, Cry of Fear, Dead Space, and briefly on Resident Evil 2. The common trope of horror games is to have a panic-inducing track for chases, combat, or during a hunt. Atlas and Amnesia take a certain strategy in their music for whenever a certain threat is present, each one having a unique track that will easily be memorized by the player so they do know what to expect. Once the music has been noticed, it will take only a few seconds for the player to process what or who to avoid at all costs. I'm sure veteran players of both Outlast and Amnesia will recognize these tracks are presenting as examples, but in case you haven't played either of your games, I'd like you to think what kind of characters would have these themes, what would they look like? Think about this before the clips play. You might be surprised. Music has a way of conveying emotion and can be easily recognized just by the tone of a particular song. The entire Resident Evil series is a pretty big example for such an occasion, with its safe rooms using a calm tone of music almost invoking a desire to just stay in one place as if the entire scenario is one bad dream. Music in horror games doesn't always have to be panic inducing, it can be used for just about any emotional moment without any dialogue whatsoever. Cry of Fear is noted often with its narrative driven storytelling that is almost only conveyed through its design, atmosphere, and short moments of reprieve in the midst of all the chaos. There's always a section through the story that gives the player an idea of what the protagonist is feeling just by the music. This is a way to breathe some life into a horror game so that it does more than just put the player on edge. It has to give some moment of clarity, safety, and as I said, reprieve. Dead Space achieves this as well. Even if you skim through most of the soundtrack that is flooded with loud and fast tracks of instruments clashing during combat. In one section, the player is tasked with fixing communications in an effort to escape the USG Ishimura as it's infested with necromorphs. During this time, there's an anonymous track that plays that is both chilling, but also hopeful. <laughs> Lastly, there is alien isolation in a certain section that comes very early on in the story. It's after a scene where the xenomorph is teased. Players don't get a clear view of it, but can hear the chaos of combat far away. In order to progress, a tram system must be called via a button. Unfortunately, the players will have to wait. To make matters worse, this music plays.
I mentioned this trick before. It's the one where the player is meant to believe from a sound effect or music track that there is a threat nearby. Makes sense to use that as a decoy in the early part of the game, right? In all seriousness, sound in horror games is essentially a game of trust. Sometimes the music will act as a warning, a presence, or will play mind games with the player. Either way, the player has to press on to progress. This brings us to the gameplay aspects of horror games. A pretty simple examination of some of the titles that extends a bit further than just the typical hide and seek method. I want to look more into what's given to the player as a strategy. Having a weapon as the player or strictly directed to just hide from any threats. Some have argued horror is better with weapons while others argue that it's better to not have weapons as it would ruin the atmosphere of being defenseless in some environments. I believe both are true. It depends on how the game uses these in execution. If a weapon outright eliminates a threat, then yes, I would agree it ruins the horror aspect of a game. But if you toss in a threat that can't be beaten by weapons, then you have an interesting premise available. If the player's weapons merely buy the player time, then the horror element is still ever-present. Here are a few examples. Resident Evil 2's remake has the tyrant constantly searching for the player throughout the Raccoon City Police Department. The player can use certain tools to buy them time. It doesn't take the tyrant out of the equation as it always finds a way back to the player. The zombies do play a role in Resident Evil 2, but they're more so a decision on whether or not the use of limited ammo is worthwhile. This is survival horror after all. Therefore, being reduced to having no ammo puts the player back into a defenseless position. So essentially we're right back to a fight or flight situation. As long as the other elements are in place and an element of surprise is present to potentially provoke the player into wasting ammunition, then I don't think having weapons in a horror game hurts. Let's take a look at another title, Alien Isolation again. The player is given a couple weapons to combat potential threats in other humans, androids, but not for the Xenomorph. All other weapons are ineffective against the Xenomorph, and can't be killed by any means, and players can learn that easily just by seeing other humans try the same method. So for the Xenomorph, players are given the Flamethrower. <laughs> Before that, however, you're able to craft tools that require a lot of hard-to-find resources to strike the Xenomorph, so the tension is still present before getting the flamethrower. One of these tools is the motion tracker, and coming back to the element of sound, this thing has driven me mad just by the sound it makes. It gives off a noise notification indicated by how close something is in a certain radius. It's guaranteed to make the player paranoid since you can't really tell what the motion tracker is detecting. Players can take out a threat with one of the weapons they have, but this also attracts the Xenomorph. So decisions in Alien Isolation become a double-edged sword. It's survival after all. Now the reason I bring up the flamethrower and the motion tracker is because of moments like this.
Yeah, I use the pause button to save myself. It's become a defense mechanism thanks to this game. Anyways, several elements are playing in this one clip. One, the music is blasting and I'm trying to pay attention to the sound of the xenomorph as it traverses in the vents. Now I pass by this doorway. I'm supposed to go through it. The panic is setting in. I'm not paying attention. Once I realize that, I keep my flamethrower ready to drive the xenomorph back to buy time. But I already jumped into the vent, so I assume I have a moment of reprieve, only to be given a quick reminder that I have to be ready at all times. I believe this moment serves as a testament to how effective horror games can be when weapons are available. It's how they're used. It has to be done right so there are multiple elements that have to work together in order to get it right. So if you can simply exploit the very threats you face, then it's not really horror anymore, is it? Weapons being present or not. The threats that are trying to stop the player actually have to be a threat. It'd be like saying Dead Space is a horror game because it has weapons in it when there are bigger elements acting for its horror status. Players are given an armory to combat the necromorphs, but they still have a few tricks up their sleeves. For one, they're fast and sometimes quiet when they have the element of surprise. They'll only scream when spotted as far as I've noticed throughout my playthrough. Necromorphs also have the ventilation system reposition themselves in an effort to catch the player off guard while its buddies do the rest. Can you imagine if players were given a means of defense against something in Outlast? A horror title that focuses more on hiding from insane asylum patients. Bit of a hyperbolic example, but all that tension will be gone in a mere second. In other titles, I think it's fair to say that zombies have lost their ability to be scary in horror games, and more akin to being cannon fodder in newer titles. Unless you look at the 28 days later kind of zombies that are more aggressive, and faster than their lumbering counterparts now often called walkers. Let's look at a more obscure game called Condemned Criminal Origins. Right off the bat, the player is given a pistol to fight off crazed individuals, it's got limited ammo and cannot be replenished unless another ranged weapon is found, so the player must find a melee weapon instead. In fact, the very pistol given at the start of the game is robbed from the player. How the hell did that happen? Maybe it's just me, but I never felt scared even with a melee weapon in my hands throughout the game. It was the other elements of the game that did it. The creepy atmosphere, the footsteps I'd hear behind me, other elements that played into my defense mechanism when I had a weapon. Again, it all depends on how the weapons are used in a horror game. It can't be an indefinite problem solver if you want the player to be on edge. You'd have to ask yourself if the weapon is effective. The flamethrower in Alien Isolation? About 50-50. It takes more shots to get the Xenomorph to retreat after a while as it learns from the encounters. The plasma cutter in Dead Space 1 and 2? Only if you're careful and keep your distance. Isaac isn't exactly great at shooting necromorphs up close. How about the pistol and Cry of Fear? Decent, the monsters move quickly and have awkward hitboxes making it difficult to hit them unless players are going up against bigger threats that will take far too much ammo. The secret chainsaw on Silent Hill 2? Yes. It's all in the effectiveness and use of weapons in horror games. Having a rocket launcher or a minigun would certainly even the odds, and more or less ruin the horror elements. Obviously it'd be fun, but if you're looking for an experience in a horror game, then that's probably not the way to go. Hiding adds to the tension, going slower in order to get past the threat also builds tension, especially if something is also chasing you at the same time in order to force the player to risk their safety and speed things up. Uh, of course, this may also lead to a sequence that's never solved by a weapon or hiding, and that's the next section I'm going to cover. Thomas, I don't got all day here. Let's get a move on. Similar to the use of weapons in horror games, jump scares depend on how they're used as well, and that's changed over time ever since Five Nights at Freddy's. Everyone has their own fear. Fear of the dark, fear of enclosed spaces, fear of the supernatural, and so on. There's bound to be something that catches someone off guard. Horror games do this through other means, whether that's just willing down a player's ability to be composed in an immersed environment or blatantly blasting noise in their ears. Objectively, the latter is a cheap trick, especially if there are instructions to pump the volume up at the start of the game. It's like being woken up from a dream, a sudden reaction. I put it like this. Horror games that only use jump scares is just a house of horrors. The cardboard cutouts that pop out of the corner to get a reaction. Once you know the trick is there, it's going to be memorized, ruining any chance for replayability. Five Nights at Freddy's first level is primarily silent, and meant to build the atmosphere more than anything else. It's a great way to build the suspense for what's to come. After that, it's pretty much the same trick over and over again. If the player fails to stop the animatronics from attacking them, loud screams blast into frame in the player's view. This is what I would consider the overuse of jump scares. The term jump scare is considered to be just the loud noises or sun images after a moment of suspense or silence. 
It's also considered to be a basic building block for horror. And that's true, since it's a noted strategy to scare people. I can't imagine a jump scare that relies on loud noises to be effective if the player just mutes the sound effects. There has to be more than just that. There needs to be tension, bait to make the player feel safe. Games that aren't categorized as horror games haven't gotten me to jump in the past, and it's usually because I don't expect them to show up. So how should a horror game use a jump scare? Let's take a look at some examples and see the difference of them. The first clip will be an example without loud noises present, while the second example after that will be the opposite. This first example is fairly simple. Cry of Fear presents a reward, a pistol or ammo if the player doesn't have one yet. Sounds nice, but it's also a trick to catch someone off guard. A light noise plays and a monster attacks from behind. At last here is during a prison chase from Chris Walker, an inmate that's been constantly chasing the player and has a very noticeable music track of his own. The player has to crawl under a broken bed frame and surprise, a jump scare pops out of nowhere. One relies on loud noises, the other relies on a mind game that can be avoided if the player simply refuses to take the bait. Let's take a look at another example using the same method as before. This one's an interesting case. Fear is more known for its action, but it has some frightening moments. This sewer section in particular gives the player an idea of when moments like this are going to happen. The HUD starts to flicker with the sound of static to indicate its malfunctioning status. Then the player is tempted with a health boost right after that. The same problem occurs to the HUD and all that is seen is the shadow of a little girl right behind the player. Fear 2 did something similar in this case and it's more direct. There's no shadow this time, and this time the flashlight flickers instead. And it can happen more than once just for good measure. As for the Layers of Fear clip, there's not much context I can add. It's a simple walking simulator game about a painter's addled mind. It takes a lot after Silent Hill, sometimes dubbed as the PT demo back in... 2014? Feels like that game was barely new. I want to go through a couple more examples before we look into more details to give you an idea. I'll provide the context with some text. I'd recommend lowering the volume as well. There's a lot of loud jump scares.
little fake. <laughs> Mr. Tibbetts. Image seems to match personnel file. It didn't come through properly, though. Can you take a close-up? Help. Help me. Then you'll die. It's all in the use of getting the player, for lack of a better term, scared. Some are blatant sequences with no connection to the rest of the elements in place, while others are linked with the gameplay, atmosphere, and sound. We may still see the overuse of the loud jump scare in future horror tiles, but there's something special about a uniquely built type of jump scare that uses other elements. Which brings us back to this section in Fear 2. This map was used in the demo for the game back in 2009, and I wish it wasn't, because there's something really special about it. The enemies you saw there are supernatural ghosts. They're easy to take out, but make absolutely zero sound until they're close to the player or are spotted by them, and to make matters worse, the flashlight stops working halfway through, so all the light is focused on the flickering ceiling lights.
bear in mind, this entire section can't be avoided. It's purely just meant for you to press on and face your fears. Sadly, after that whole exchange in the entire hallway, the game just focuses back to being loud and in your face, and that's a real shame. If there's a possibility that a jump scare can be avoided by the player's choice, then there's something worth looking into. They shouldn't have to rely on a trigger point when the player interacts with something. This takes all those cardboard cutouts from the horror house out of the horror game, adding replayability to something unique. Jump scares have a place in horror games, they just need more than just loud noises. More inner workings with other systems and elements that make a horror game. Overall, horror games have a lot to do to carry them to a spotlight, and the trend is always changing. Just look at any horror games that came out near the same time as Slenderman. Five Nights at Freddy's and the Silent Hill demo. The same could be applied to horror movies, a bit more of a field I'm into with such examples as The Grudge. You usually find a creepy little girl that looks similar to The Grudge. Nowadays, you might find it difficult to find horror games that came out near the same time as Five Nights at Freddy's that don't use animatronics as a scary threat. It's a changing trend, therefore a changing strategy to keep the players on their toes. Flashlight flickering? Check. Static noises and ominous music? Check. Creepy ambience to fill the tension. Check. Unkillable monster that's always hunting you? Check. What changes is the design. The strategy often doesn't change. It's all in execution. It could be slow and methodical or fast and in your face. Building tension can take a while in a horror game, and it's usually telling if it's going to be a subtle kind of horror based on the timing. Horror can be subjective. That much is true based on everyone's different kind of phobia. We're all afraid of something whether we admit it or not. It's whether the execution of horror in a game is well built on using a unique set of tricks on the player, and not the same trick over and over. It'd be like a magician using the same method for their magic trick. Someone is going to get how it works eventually. For example, Dead Space 1. As much as I love this game, a lot of the same sequences happen behind glass. Fear 2 uses a lot of QTE sections to try to scare the player. And Outlast likes to use loud noises. Sometimes these work subjectively, but objectively these are poor attempts at scaring the player. Maybe I'd find something more on an individual level for these horror tiles, but I honestly found more interest in how this genre and the video game market is made. It must always change and keep to a complex system, never using the same trick in a short time span. Mix up the variation. The atmosphere can be chilling just by the architecture, character designs, or just the world building on its own. Sound has to play into a feeling of tension or safety to push the player to progress, and each of these elements have to mesh together in order to make something unique and memorable. The Xenomorph's AI in Alien Isolation is essentially legendary now, based on how it adapts to the player's strategy to hide or fight it. The story of Cry of Fear is cherished for its atmosphere and narrative. Silent Hill and Resident Evil titans in the horror genre. This town is full of monsters. How can you sit there and eat pizza? And Amnesia The Dark Descent is considered one of the greatest horror games ever. It's amazing what horror games can achieve just with a few elements at their disposal. A genre that builds memories based on location and encounters. Or maybe those are more so moments of PTSD. That's probably more accurate to the theme of this genre. Regardless, I'm not too keen on horror games. Sometimes I'd avoid them a couple of years ago and stick to something like Borderlands or Doom. But I can't deny there's something special about horror games. We'll see where this genre takes players to next and what trends and elements it tries next to get under their skin. Until then, we have these titles to look back on. Thanks for watching this video. If you're new here, please let me know what you think. Opinions are important and so are discussions. In the future, I want to look into specific games based on their storytelling narratives. It'd be a long process, but it's important to understand what video games put into narrative actions. As I said before, I'm more into the world of filmmaking, but it's fair to say that video games are trying to be like this as well. I mean, really, how many times have we had a movie try to adapt a game only to have it fall flat on its face? I'm not sure how long the series would be, maybe an hour or so. The first project would be on Dead Space, since the remake is coming out. Fairly timely, I'd say, and it's my favorite of the horror games that I've played. In the meantime, you can reluctantly check out my source filmmaker work on DeviantArt. Yes, I know the site has a bad reputation, I don't blame you, I hate it too sometimes. I also do some writing work there, trying to do some original pieces. Feedback is always welcome on that. As for YouTube, I wanted to try to actually put some decent work on it, beside the occasional ha-ha funny video that's way too easy to edit together. We'll see how that goes in the future. 
I'd like to thank a couple people before I close this video out. Special thanks to my friend Hunter, who is always supporting me and checking my bad spelling. Thank you to my friends Zai and Cupid for pushing me to put this kind of video out on YouTube. And of course, thank you to the viewers for sticking around this long. The support is always appreciated. So until next time, this is Arsenal, signing off.